Uh, yes, agriculture was the mainstay of Niger's economy before the discovery of oil, at crude oil to be specific. Now, over the past five years, the sector has contributed an average of 23.5% to GDP and generates 5.1% of export earnings. But according to a recent report by the National Bureau of Statistics, Nigeria's exported agro-food items were 165.27 billion naira. That's in the second quarter of 2021. Now, representing a 112% increase compared to 78.03 billion naira recorded in the corresponding period of 2020, making it the highest on record. The recent value also represents a 30% increase when compared to 127.18 billion naira worth of exports recorded in the previous quarter. The latest development, or this latest development, however, shows that Nigeria has continued to expand its ability to earn foreign exchange from agricultural exports, especially during a time when all revenue is not as so robust as it used to be due to OPEC production quota and oscillating prices of crude oil. All right, I have joining me live from our Abuja studios. I introduced him earlier as a partner and the chief economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers Nigeria, Dr. Andrew Nevin. Dr. Nevin, good afternoon to you. Hi, Tolo. It's great to be here. Yep, let's start up this way. Uh, exports surges to its highest on record. Uh, when I saw that report, I shared with you what is responsible for this. Well, I mean, I, I think that there's been a lot of... There's been a lot of focus on agriculture over the last decade, and now it's kind of bearing fruits. And, of course, people understand that um, the big export ones, so cashews, ginger, uh, uh, cassava, et cetera, I mean, those are really highly valuable, right? And as those export chains get sorted out, we're going to see more and more exports in that area. And I think it'll continue to go up. And once, it, once we've sorted it out, it can go very, very quickly on that and make a difference. So you said before, it's 5% of our exports, because of course, crude oil is about 94% of our exports. But I can see that continuing to grow, uh, you, know, you know, 30, 40% a year, or maybe greater on that. Um, but it's just working at that logistics chain. And part of it is also going back to, all the way back to the farmers. So how do you organize the farmers so they get benefits from it? They're doing the, the growth of these crops the right way, they have the right seeds, they have the right um, technologies and approaches, and they're also benefiting from the system. But if the farmers are benefiting, you know, then the whole chain can move it through. So I think it's really exciting. And as I said, I mean, we spent a decade getting more and more focus on agriculture in this country, or refocus on agriculture, and I think it's starting to bear fruit, particularly in these export markets. So uh, we're gradually uh, getting uh, a headway, if, I could, if, I, if I'm allowed to use the word, with regards to the agricultural space. But, uh, Andrew, I'm worried about insecurity and all of the issues that have happened with regards to farmers and all of that. I was thinking that it would have the effect of this. Are we producing enough to consume before we even talk, of, talk, talk, talk about export? Well, of course, you can import some foods you can't produce and export foods that others can't produce. So there's no problem with that. But obviously, import substitutions are growing more food, so we don't need to export. Because, I mean, we talked about the number that we're exporting now. But, of course, I still think, if I remember right, we're importing about 3 or $4 billion worth of food. Uh, we don't need to do that. I mean, this is perhaps uh, you know, one of the most fertile, if not the most fertile countries. Everything is two crops a year. Everything grows in this country. Country, so we're perfectly capable of producing all the food. So beyond the, the uh, export crops or cash crops as they're called, there are other crops that we need to focus on the agricultural value chain. I mean, I'll mention tomatoes. I think most people are aware that we lose about half of the tomato, beautiful tomatoes. So, I mean, the flavor of the tomatoes, I live in Abuja now, they come fresh, and it's just fantastic. The flavor of the tomatoes is amazing in this country. And yet we, and of course they're a staple food and part of jollof rice. Um, but you know, we lose half of tomatoes from, from the field to the, to the plate on that, which is just a tragedy. So we don't need to just build out the, the um, export value chains. We need to build the internal agro-processing chains, which of course the parts are about helping the farmer and the technical assistance and the seeds and the fertilizer and how to use it and the outreach, that part. But also once we have a product 
then how do we process it? So in the case of tomatoes, I mean, you need to turn it quite quickly to, to keep into tomato paste, which means we need domestic manufacturing or processing of the tomato paste in that whole industry. Um, and another big part of it, of course, is the financing, because you want to be able to create a system where the farmer have access to financing at the right times, when they sell their, or they don't have to sell their produce at the lowest price. So all of these elements are coming together. But I mean, there's a lot of work on it, and I think we've seen a good progress in the last three or four years. And, and these numbers on the exports are really heartening. What impact would this have on Nigeria's foreign trade uh, figures? Uh, already, we are, I think we are doing well because they increased looking at the Q2 figures for 2021. Right, so if you think about, about our balance of payments, and, now we, and of course our currency has really been under pressure the last few months. There's a few reasons for that. I mean, one is because of the uh, collapse in foreign direct investment caused by COVID. People don't make direct investment unless they come to visit, so that really declined. And then the portfolio investment, uh, because we had the decline in interest rates, um, it's less attractive for foreign portfolio investors, the so-called hot money. And that's a couple of factors that have put real pressure on the exchange rate. So obviously we, we've known for some time we want to diversify and export more. You know, we at PwC have talked a lot about the diaspora and how big a, th that is on that. But of course, we still want to export things. So I think from our viewpoint, there are really two major things that, that we think we can export in the short term. Um, and one of them is services, and we've talked a lot about that, exporting Nigerian brains without leaving Nigeria because the services don't have to go through the infrastructure. But in terms of physical products that we can export, um, the, 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 the industry at the top of our list is clearly agriculture. So those cash crops that really have a high international price earn dollars for the country. And it said, you know, now we're starting to get the logistic systems right. Um, um, so that volume can increase very, very fast. There's no reason it can't be 10 times higher in, you know, three or five years. And of course, there's a lot of business people, uh, people or, you know, sort of large farm groups that are very interested in this. So as they see others being, having export success, they're going to follow in and have export success. Of course, state governors are going to see it. They're going to support. I know there's one or two states that want to have export processing zones for agricultural products so that they can aggregate what's coming from the farmers and then deal with issues issues around quality, certification, et cetera. So, so all of these elements of the system are coming together. But you know, as I said, once you get the pipeline going, we'll really see some big numbers. I mean, if you take a look at another African country, Kenya, I mean, the number, the, the quantity of uh, flowers they ship by air because they're so valuable overnight, I mean, it's just enormous. And they've built this up, got the systems going, and we're heading, we're heading the same way. Mm. Now, Moving back to this positive report that, yeah, of course, positive when exports continues to grow, it took me back to the effect on our foreign exchange markets. Well, my first report on the show today shows that uh, exchange rate still remains very high. That's at the parallel market. We're doing about 580 naira. When are we going to get to that point where our agricultural produce or what we export will impact on our forex market, on our on our Naira gives value to our currency? Well, that's a good question. I mean, uh, to have, have, have that sort of impact. But you look at the numbers that you put up there. So you, we exported about 160 billion in um, one quarter, so 600 billion or 700 billion in a year at that rate. So, so at the official exchange rate, that would be you know a little less than two billion, maybe 1.6 billion dollars. So obviously a far cry from oil, which is 50 billion in theory, but even diaspora remittances, which are 20 or 25 billion. But on the other hand, if you go from 1.6 up to double or triple, it'll start to have a, a big impact. So you know, if you ask me the question, uh, I don't like predicting the future, but if you ask me how long before it starts as an impact. I mean, I think in terms of actually on our balance of payments, if we could get it, you know, double, triple in the next three, four years, then it'll start to have a significant, uh, a significant impact. Then it starts to be relative remittances, obviously a lot smaller, but not, it's not zero on that. I mean, if we got up to $5 billion within five years, I think that would make a big difference to the country. And then, of course, simultaneously, as I said, we should be doing the import substitution. So. How do you improve your balance of payments? You import less and you export more. So if we took our, just to put some numbers on it, if we took our um, exports of commodities from 1.6 billion per year to 5 billion, 
and then we took our imports, which I think are three or four billion down to one billion, all of a sudden you've got a six or seven billion dollar swing in your balance of payments, and that is a significant difference. And I think we could achieve that three to five years. Mm. Mechanizing and improving agriculture is also an argument uh, using technology. Uh, in the agricultural space is what people are also talking about. Why I'm interested in this is for our youth to also take advantage of the sector so that we can be interested in becoming farmers, just like we want to become doctors, lawyers, journalists, and all of that. How well, or what's all of the interventions we've had, particularly from the CBN, a lot of money has been pushed into the agricultural space. When do you think we'll get to this point that agriculture will get so attractive to everyone and that will be the space that everyone wants to run into? Uh, are we going to get to that point anytime soon? Well, I, I think we've already seen the emergence of, I mean, I know personally quite a lot of, of uh, I mean, maybe not call them farmers, but business people that have become more and more interested in agriculture. And, you know, they're thinking across many, you know, palm oil, which is an export crop, rice. I was talking to one large rice farmer who's really spent a lot of effort over the last six or seven years on them. Of course, if you're doing one crop, they also look at other cash sort of crops, vegetables, some of the export crops. So you're seeing the emergence of these indigenous groups. I mean, you always think of something, a group like Olam coming into Nigeria as a foreign firm. But actually, you know, a lot of Nigerians are interested in, in their own agriculture. And there's a lot of business people I know that are trying agricultural products out in their own, in their own state on that. And uh, so, I mean, and they're finding in some pockets that they're, they're able to make money, right? I mean, and prices rise, and then you have a, a response to that by the farmers. They grow more of that. Eventually, the, far, the, the price falls for that crop. But, you know, farmers can make money on that. So, I, I mean, I think, I think there are opportunities for young, and you can see some of these programs where they give them land. Everyone has access to land. If they have a little bit of technical assistance and given the seeds, they can, they can try it out. So I, I, I think we're kind of at that point. But obviously, mechanization is a big part of it. I mean, you need that kind of Uber tractor. Like, you know, no, no farmer can own their own. If you take rice, for example, their own tractor to do the plowing and planting, and then the harvester to do the, the combine harvester to do the harvest. They're not going to own that themselves. So that system is still, I think, in its infancy, and, and particularly that mechanization, because uh, you know, if you're going to attract a young person in, I don't think it's going to be the back-breaking type of manual farming that you know, has been done in the, in the past. They're going to be attracted in, like you're showing pictures of mechanization of it, if it's, if it's mechanized, if they can get to a reasonable uh, scale. But, but I also need to say that, that despite the promising future for agriculture and the attention and the, what the CBN has done, starting under His Royal Highness Mohammed Sanusi II when he was the governor, and then now continuing on with, with the, the governor, Governor Emefele. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. But the biggest problem right now that agricultural faces and why we're seeing food inflation is because of insecurity. So there are acres or hectares that are not being planted because farmers do not feel safe in their communities. So uh, you know, one, one large farmer was explaining what's happening right now is people are staying very close to their house because it's safe. They're farming a much smaller amount of land than they would. And I'm really worried about the food security issue over the next uh, six to nine months because we need, these, we need the hectares farmed. We need farmers farming on that. And in an insecure environment, we're not getting that. So that's really a great concern for the country. Mm. Agricultural productivity. Uh, key. So now as we, as we move on, because I really like us to also talk about something very important, uh, as important as agriculture. That's the E-Naira uh, thing, as the website is also opened. Now, before we go there, what's your projection for the third quarter, uh, the agricultural space? Do you see better improvement? Uh, we move very close to the harvest season. Uh, what are you expecting? The prices, uh, we're going to see a reduction. Inflation is still above 20% for food. Well, I mean, the direction of travel has been inflation coming down. Food inflation has been coming down. Um, there should be more production. As I said, I, it's, just, it's hard for me to judge. People know I don't comment on the security situation. The one mm. negative to this is the security situation. And as I said, it's, to the extent that farmers aren't planting, I think it's going to put p potentially real pressure on the, on the food system. And that, as I said, really worries me. Hmm. So lots of good news, but overshadowed by our security situation, which, and, you know, we have more and more commentators that have come, senior political leaders that have been very clear. The number one issue for the economy is actually security now. 
if we don't solve some of the security challenges or address them, we're not going to be able to have social and economic development. Mm. Now, Mr. Nevin, before I let you go, just uh, a few minutes ago, we see that uh, the E. Uh, that's uh, the e naira uh, website is already opened and according to what i saw here uh more than one million subscribers just immediately but first before we what do you make of this october 1st is already is around the corner it's just friday how does this come to you right no i mean i think it's i think it's very exciting for the nation i mean you know what what is what is the e naira the e naira is the digital form of the Naira. So it's legal public tender. It's a liability of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Uh, so the same way you can use the Naira, you can use the E-Naira. They're interchangeable. Uh, but the technology, so of course we all are familiar with hearing about Bitcoin and Ethereum. So that technology we've now taken and applied to the way that our financial system works. So using the same the distributed ledger technology, the central bank can issue the e-Naira. And the thing about it is it's just fantastic for low-value transactions, right? Uh, because there's no, if you think about a POS, for example, it's a very complicated chain, right? So, you know, I, have, I'm, I put my debit card in to the POS, it contacts my bank, who contacts the NIBS uh, system, who then contacts the bank of where the money is going to, who then contacts the customer, and there's breaks everywhere in the chain. Under the eNIRA, with the distributed ledger technology, the, the clearing and settlement and payment are all the same process, uh, totally transparent to everyone. It never fails, or if it fails, it doesn't fail in one part, where one person gets credited, but the other person's, de or usually debited, but not credited, for example. Um, so it's really a big advance, and it brings the cost. I mean, I think the CBN announced um, that the cost from e Naira wallet to e Naira wallet is zero. Um, so for the bottom of the pyramid, for, for small value transactions, it really helps uh, reduce the cost, make it easier to do transactions on that. And of course, you know, the e Naira is a journey. October 1 is meant to be the beginning of it, but there'll be many innovations, I think, along the way. I'm sure that CBN has some sort of roadmap they'll bring out soon. And then all the pr other financial players, the uh, banks and fintechs, will build on the eNIRA platform. So I'm very excited about it. I think we're going to be in a position in a few months where we are the first large country to really have uh, digital currency working for our people, and I think it's a great innovation. So if you think about the CBN and the Bankers Committee, they brought in the BVN, the Bankers Verification Number, a fantastic innovation, most advanced in the world. Not a big surprise that the CBN is pushing, you know, pushing the, the payments um, system system here. And the other thing I think that is really important about the ENR is it really adds resiliency because this, the NIB system for payments is fantastic. Again, really world class. But the entire financial payments infrastructure is kind of built on the NIB system. Now we have the eNIRA system as well, so we, we have a little more resiliency and redundancy in the system. So I think it's I think it's great, and I think a lot of people are going to be looking at what Nigeria does and calling the Central Bank of Nigeria, you know, to look at the progress they've made. It's around security uh, that seems to be very important to everyone, and uh, we've been sharing concerns with regards to that well, security of the eNIRA. Well, I think that fundamentally, I mean, of course, we've all heard of, of people, you know, having losses of digital assets, and but, but it's fundamentally the DLT technology is incredibly uh, safe and, and powerful on that. I mean, it's uh, basically the cryptography, it's ha hacker-proof. When we hear about these people losing their Bitcoin, it's they're not storing it properly in the wallet the way it was meant to be done. But the e-wallet, e-Naira wallet is set up, you know, perfectly secure on that, perfectly traceable. You know, you know where it's gone to any other wallet on there. I mean, it's just a, a closed system, if you will, on that way. It, it, it um, happens instantaneously. I mean, obviously the CBN, I'm pretty sure, is taking the, the, you know, the highest security uh, issues I I seriously on that. But I'm not, I'm not worried about the security. I mean, I think that the DLT technology has been really robust around the world, and you know, the CBN is going to implement it in a world-class way. So, so I think it's going to be very safe for Nigerians. To leave it, I've been speaking to Dr. Andrew oh, sorry, But I also need to add the million, go the ahead, million go downloads. Ahead. It just shows you the interest. So, so you know the, the the uptake. I mean, there'd be some other jurisdictions where I think 
uh, the, the, the digital currency has been introduced in some of these smaller countries, and it's used. But you know, the interest here. If, so if you look at the way Nigerians use financial services, I mean, I think there's two and a half billion you know, NIP NIBS transactions, the instant payment transactions. I think there's six billion USSD transactions between banking, financial services, and telecom. I mean, Nigerians embrace this. You were saying it earlier with Lanre, and of course he's talking to logistics, you know, how Nigerians embrace technology at every, every level um, on that. So it's not a big surprise there's such a, an interest in it. I mean, I think if I, CBN, if I was a CBN, I would be worried about, you know, you know, too rapid an uptake, and they need to be careful to make sure they're ready for Nigerians showing an interest in the in the ENIRA and wanting to use the ENIRA. Hmm. Dr. Andrew Nevin, I see you're enjoying Abuja so well, the fresh tomatoes and all that you talked about. But let's just allow you to enjoy the rest of your day. Partner and Chief Economist, PwC Nigeria. Thank you, Dr. Nevin, for your time. Thank you, Toro. It's always great to see you.